Hello and welcome to Toward a Quality of Life. We're here in early January of 2003. Tonight we're going to levitate a bit. We're going to raise our psyches up and float away into the world of the more abstract kind of thinking. Because I have with me Dr. Juliet Floyd, an associate professor at Boston University. And she is a philosopher and a professor and teacher and researcher and thinker in philosophy and particularly logic as it relates to philosophy. Good evening, Dr. Floyd. Hello, Nancy. Let us begin tonight. I know we are going to define or talk about what logic is, but I believe it might be better if we start off with philosophy. Why philosophy? Why philosophy? Well, we're all philosophers, whether we want to be or not, because all of us live in a world that is not perfect. And all of us have ideas about what would make the world better. And we all try our best to make the world better, but we also have to face living in a world where our ideals are not always realized. We all try our best to make the world better, but we also have to face living in a world where to think about philosophy than others. And I feel very privileged to be a professor of philosophy at Boston University because it gives me the time to read about the history of philosophy, working with examples of thinkers who have tried to develop a systematic view of themselves and their place in the world. So I think philosophy is unavoidable. Uh, for all of us, I simply get to spend more time doing it than most people do. So you're uh, telling me that philosophy is for the purpose of trying to make a better world ultimately? Well, or living in an imperfect world. That is to say, uh, people don't always agree with us about what we think is right. Uh, life is not always fair. Sometimes innocent people suffer. These are great problems. There's great evil in the world. And of course one tries to make the world better. Not only philosophers do that. But at the most basic existential level, each one of us has to develop a picture of how our lives hang together, who we are as people, and how what we think about the world's being right and wrong fits in. In other words, in being human, we are, no matter what our walk of life is, or our daily routine, or what kind of thoughts we think we are absorbed with, we are all figuring out how it hangs together at some level. Yes, and we're all asking questions. We're asking questions about why the world is the way it is. Why are there so many evils and injustices in the world? And, of course, human beings from different cultures and different walks of life come up with very, very different answers to those questions. Most of the world's major religions are devoted to trying to locate people's lives in a kind of overarching structure. What has made Western philosophy different is that it has tried to pursue this in the form of an investigation of science and of reason giving. So people will try to come up with arguments for why one policy decision would be better than another, arguments for why one way of life would be better than another. And philosophy has very much been bound up in the practice of answering why. Why do we think one policy is better than another? Why are we here? Why are we here? How could we be alive? What mm -hmm. is life all about? Mm -hmm. Who the hell knows? Mm -hmm. And it just dawned on me when you were speaking that death, for example, is a moment when these very fundamental questions come up. We go through many stages mm -hmm. of the unfairness of it, the anger, mm -hmm. how, how cruel life can be, how mysterious mm -hmm. uh, we can lose faith. In, in just being alive. Mm -hmm. So certainly there's none of us, unfortunately, that can escape that kind of experience. That's right. 
That's right. We all are forced to philosophize by one or another circumstance. By being alive. But e and even persons of so-called um, um, le lesser level intellect, for example, persons that might be called mentally retarded or something, mm -hmm. they're also still figuring out how things hang together. Or a person mm -hmm. with schizophrenia, no, 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 no uh, impunation, impugning of, of people's character is intended, but n even, even if you're possessed with severe mental illness, you're still figuring out s at some level somehow how it all hangs together. Yes. Children, for example, uh, also are figuring out how things hang together. And in fact, children, people with major psychological problems, these people teach all of us, I think, uh, something about what it is to try to get a vision of things that makes sense. So then if we were animals, if we were just elephants and lions and tigers grazing in the savannas of Africa, would we have to think of philosophy or do we have to think of philosophy <laughs> because we are human? We do, it seems <laughs> like we, we don't have to reason or give a reason or figure out why in the, in the other natural world that's not human, it would seem. Yes, there's a wonderful essay written by the philosopher Nietzsche on, One the, of my use, on the use and abuse of history. And he begins the essay by describing the cow in the field in just this way. The cow gets up, eats grass, walks around, drinks some water. The cow is not bothered by ec larger existential questions of where it came from, where it's going, what its life means in relation to other cows' lives. The cow, as Nietzsche says, has no history. A human being is fated to having a history or at least a conception of its own history. Human beings just have the need to think about their origins and their place in the human world and the natural world. So then I'm presuming, since we are all creatures and even subject, shall I say, to philosophy, whether we realize it or not explicitly, then, it's, then it would be very important to be as, or it would seem, it would, it would appeal to us to be as careful and as knowledgeable and as uplifted and proper and best as we could be at this condition that we're sort of trapped in, if you will? Well, uh, we like to think so. Of course, uh, not everybody acts well all the time. And Dostoevsky is a good example of someone who deeply appreciated that sometimes there's a human need to be bad just to be bad, to be worse just to be worse. So. We're not saying that everyone acts well all the time, or even that everyone aspires to be better all of the time. But what we are saying is that it's, it's a part of human life, a very natural part of human life for most of us, to look for reasons, to try to get things to hang together to make sense. But even if we want to be bad, we still have reasons. No matter what our choices are, we're still in the realm of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we're in the realm of philosophy, wittingly or unwittingly, my point is that we might want to be the best at it, no matter what our so-called moral choices might be, that we might want to uh, raise ourselves as humans, whether it, we are ethically good or bad, but but make the best of what our reasoning capacity might, might make for us. Yes. I mean, insofar as all of us are inclined to reflect on how values and societies hang together, uh, I think philosophy is a good friend to have in the sense that if you take the time to puzzle through and think through the reasons behind things, then when you meet a conflict or a difficult circumstance in life, you will have a certain kind of conceptual apparatus, an intellectual apparatus to use in the face of that conflict. Of course, one can think too much, and that's a very important philosophical insight as well. Sometimes one doesn't want to try to think and examine and, and be self-critical and be critical. But 
uh, it's a good idea to cultivate the skill. Let me put it this way. It's rather cheap to hold ideas and never run them past your best intellectual or even communal capacity. Mm -hmm. It's rather cheap, mm -hmm. no matter where you stand on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. In other words, more can be had of you as a human being. Mm -hmm. And that's where mm -hmm. we come to this thing called reason. Mm -hmm. And reason involving this major capacity called logic, which, which I invited Dr. Floyd here because of uh, noticing, in my opinion, the dearth of logic in so much public discourse. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about reason, reasoning, on all these basic questions and on any questions, and the basic ones being philosophy and any questions being anything you can come up with, like is it better to eat a tomato or an apple? <laughs> uh, uh, reasoning and its, its big brother, if you will, uh, logic? Well, uh, I sort of prepared my notes tonight to talk mainly about logic, uh, which is a very important branch of knowledge. It's been being studied really for thousands of years, and it's very important in philosophy, as we were saying earlier. Logic comes from, our word logic comes from the Greek word logos, which means reasoning or discourse or even word or language. And in the broadest sense, what logic is, is a study of patterns of reasoning, forms of argument, styles or types of argument that we can recognize as people defend their beliefs. Human beings try to influence each other in many different kinds of ways, but one of these ways is through argument. Uh, Human beings do, naturally, in every culture we know that has language, they do justify their beliefs, their policy decisions, their behavior toward one another. A child, as we know, who is learning the language, begins to ask the question, why, at a very, very early age. So it's something very, very deep. Uh, the question, why, is really asking for a reason to be given. And reasons are always given in language. So argumentation and reasoning are a crucial part of how we communicate with one another and influence one another. And logic as a branch of knowledge focuses on the structures and the principles and the concepts that are available to us within our language for use in shaping argumentation and reasoning. The m most famous American philosopher of logic W. V. Quine, who taught at Harvard for many years and died only two years ago. How he, old was he, may I ask? Uh, he was in his 90s mm -hmm. when he died. Um, Quine was a very famous teacher of logic, and he wrote a lovely little phrase about what logic is. He said, logic chases truth up the tree of grammar, by which he meant that logic helps us get to the truth in the enterprise of pursuing inquiry. But it gets there by focusing on grammar, by focusing on structure in language of a certain kind. And it's surprising when one begins to investigate types of arguments just how much structure there really is. So first and foremost, what the logician has to do is to idealize the way in which information is exchanged in everyday life. We don't always give reasons for our beliefs in everyday life. It would take too much time if we did. So we're already idealizing our thoughts and beliefs when we begin to place pressure on them and ask, what are our reasons for believing them? And in logic, we conceive of an argument in a somewhat abstract way not as two people shouting at each other across the din dining room table, that's which is the way... That's not what you mean by argument. That's not what a logician means by argument, even though we all very well understand that in real life many arguments devolve to that. What we do is we try to rationally reconstruct the route that the parties to the argument are using to reach their beliefs. What do you mean by rationally? Well, by rationally, we mean we try to show how one belief depends upon another. For a logician, an argument is really a kind of organized structure of sentences or of beliefs. 
And the most important distinction here is the distinction between a premise and a conclusion. So when we meet disputes in everyday life and we're trying to get clear about their logic, their structure, we're trying to pinpoint where two people really ultimately agree or disagree, we can think about the argument in this abstract way. The first question is always, what's the conclusion that a person is arguing for? Where are they getting to in the process of reasoning? The next question, once you've settled that, is what are the premises or the principles that they're relying on to reach that conclusion? You look first to where they're going, where they end up, where they're going to end up. You look to that first? Yes. Every argument in the logician sense has a conclusion. And of course, in everyday life, we might reach the end point of thought by a very indirect route. We might not know in a way where we're going to end up when we start. So very often, the logical clarification of a person's belief system is the thing that comes last. It's not the thing that comes first. What comes first are the brainstorming thought processes and images and metaphors that guide us to discover truths. What logic does, as I say, is to reconstruct how one can reach that conclusion on the basis of which kinds of principles. And it's very important to understand, therefore, and the word therefore is the key word, because the word therefore is what flags the conclusion, A, therefore, B. It's very important, the most basic thing to understand in teaching logic is that students must learn, all of us have to relearn, I think, over and over again, the point that you can agree with someone's conclusion or moral position, but feel that the particular premises or presuppositions or principles they use to defend that view are very poor or not as good as they could be. And conversely, you could disagree with someone very much about their conclusion, and yet come to an appreciation of the logic of their position, understand how that belief is structured in terms of a system. So what I think of as useful in logic is it provides us with a way to stop shouting at each other across the dinner table and step back and try to figure out what really is at issue between us. And about that, even human beings who disagree with one another vehemently about political opinions or about moral beliefs, very often you can get them to agree on the logic of their positions. And that is the first step toward trying to make progress. Uh, isn't it important to use logic uh, just to examine your own thoughts in a peaceful manner? Not, not, when you use the word argument, you're meaning discourse, you're meaning talk between people, whether it's heated or not. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. way we understand each other, the way we communicate and either, you know, get to a valid point or, or not get to a valid point, agree or disagree, but, but also we can argue with ourselves in a sense and check out who we are and what we think in our own reflective ways, in very quiet, pacific ways. Yes, absolutely. Um, by criticism, I include self-criticism, and very often you're in a dialogue or an argument with yourself in a certain kind of way. I mean, of course, all of us are notoriously good at deceiving ourselves about what our real motives are in acting the way we do. Uh, and sometimes we require someone else to point out to us what may really lie psychologically behind what we do. But nevertheless, it's a very human thing to want to make sense of your own beliefs and to try to give the best arguments to yourself that you can for why you take up a particular political cause or despise a particular moral opinion or whatnot. It's very important to understand what your basis is, because only then can you have the possibility of opening yourself up to alternative ways of thinking about your own beliefs, and maybe even changing your mind if you find that the arguments you give yourself for a particular course of action just don't hold up. All of us have the capacity to argue with ourselves. That's very important.
And in a way, that's what philosophy is about. It's an argument with oneself uh, about one's place in the world. Exactly like sometimes you might find yourself driving in a car and realize that you may not believe in God or that your faith is shaken. I, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden it could hit you. Mm -hmm. Or it could hit you perhaps that you do believe in a God or an afterlife. Mm -hmm. Or you might be attending a party, as has happened at some prisons, when, when prisoners are being put to death, mm -hmm. executed. And you might be walking home and think you might think about it a little bit, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't believe in the death penalty, you might see some crime that is so awful that, that it makes you wonder, am I right for a moment? These kinds of reflections are all basic philosophy. They are. And how we reason together in a public discourse about issues like the death penalty is a very, very important matter. There are very different kinds of arguments that can be given on either side of this question, it seems to me. And what political philosophy at its best is about is scrutinizing the different kinds of justifications people try to give, pro and con, so that we can try to systematize, orient ourselves in our way of thinking around basic principles that we try to agree on in order to live with one another in a public culture in which, after all, in our society we face the fact that not all of us will agree on these policies or these moral positions. We live in a pluralistic, democratic society and we cannot expect there to be agreement on a particular religious view or a particular moral view. Nevertheless, what we can do is to try to look at the different reasons that can be given in a public forum, publicly, with other free and equal citizens, in order to reach one or another particular point of view. So you're saying, as humans, we have the capacity to reason. The brain can really go through some rigorous kind of activity churning the wheels, reasoning as hard and as dedicatedly as possible, and that really we don't have to be uh, punching each other out or spitting or, or uh, doing devious things, that if we really strengthened our capacity to reason, we could just progress we, wherever that would take us as, as a society. Right. I mean, I don't know about the brain. It's a very interesting question whether logical rules are a kind of universal grammar that is realized in the brain. Uh, something like that point of view has been being defended by Noam Chomsky for many, many years. What Chomsky did was to take the tremendous revolution in mathematical logic that happened at the end of the 19th century, where the first, from one point of view, the first computer programming languages, the first formalized, codified systems of logic were actually laid out. And what Chomsky did was to hypothesize that that structure is actually innate in all human brains. Um, I'm not sure that I'm quite as optimistic as Chomsky is that we're going to find it in the brain. I think we find it in the practice of language as much as in the behavior of the brain. That is, it's only through being inculcated into a language a language in which we play the game of asking you why, and you play the game of learning how to answer why, and you know the difference between an answer that speaks to the question and an answer that doesn't. I think that this public practice of language and dialogue is an equally important feature of it. Um, so yes, it's, it's part of what it is to speak a language. I wanted to say about the brain, I, I wasn't inferring that it, it's innate to the brain necessarily, but that it's in the brain that the cogitation, whether you've learned how or you're disposed that way, it's the brain that, that would be doing all the activity, the neuronal activity, just to use a metaphor. In other words, working your brain hard, just like you work out physically to stay fit mm -hmm. with your muscles. This is like exercising what people have referred to as the muscle of the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Well, one, one does that when one tries to reflect on one's own beliefs. Um, but I like to think of it equally as exercising one's ability to employ language uh, generally with other people and with oneself. I sometimes feel that I'm not clear at all on what I really want to say until I've said it, until I've got the language out there in front of me. Ah, now I know what I was trying to say. So the brain does some of it. Uh, our public cooperation with one another in language does it. And the world cooperates by being regular enough that things don't suddenly go haywire for no reason. Uh, all these things contribute to the kind of structure and pattern that I think we need in language in order to be able to communicate with one another. Well, I just wanted to say, like, uh, from a neuro neurological, neuropsych, even if you put it out there to the culture, the feedback is going back to your brain, and your brain is utilizing it to go back into the culture. I, the, it's mm -hmm. the organ in being mm -hmm. alive by which it's the medium mm -hmm. through which we can process all these things, mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It may not be the source, but it's the medium. Yes, yes. That's Cut it. off my head and I won't talk. Exactly. That's been known for a long time. Exactly. And um, you said people have it's good for people to scrutinize justifications. Mm -hmm. How do you scrutinize justifications for things? And justifications being like reasons? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look carefully at the language, we can notice certain things about patterns and arguments. Um, there's one kind of argument that's been especially important for the science of logic. And this is so for thousands of years. You can find in Aristotle, for example, a very systematic attempt to classify this particular kind of argument into different groups. And that's a, a deductively valid argument, is what I would call it. It's an argument like this. Let's take as one premise that all human beings are mortal or die. Take as your second premise that Socrates is a human being. Well, if those are your two premises, then it certainly is going to follow from that that Socrates is mortal. Because if all humans are mortal and he's human, then he must be mortal. Now, if you examine this particular pattern, you'll see that its validity doesn't have anything to do particularly with Socrates or humanity or mortality. It has to do with the form of the argument. All A's are B's. Something is an A. Therefore, the conclusion follows, it must be a B. Now, these purely deductive arguments were of very great interest both to philosophers and to mathematicians because they show us something very deep about these most basic, purely logical forms of reasoning. And the science of logic, which primarily began with Aristotle and culminated in the work of Frege and Russell and others at the end of the 19th century, the, 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 the question was, can we find a complete description of all those different forms of purely deductive argument? And in a certain very rigorous mathematical sense, we now know that we can. What's interesting is it took thousands of years to get clear about all the basic deductive principles required to cover all deductive arguments. Not all deductive arguments are as easy to see as the one that I just gave you. But it turns out we have, in a certain way, a complete codification of those. And the theory of this complete codification really is the theory of algorithms at the same time. That's why I say in modern computer science, logic is used all the time to inspire the creation of programming languages in order to codify thinking of a certain kind in artificial intelligence and in order to get clear about our notion of an algorithm itself. So something very important happened to philosophers' ways of talking about language in the last 150 years. Uh, without Frege's realizing it, he was providing the means by which a machine could read a language and, in a certain sense, deduce conclusions. 
Frege didn't think he was doing that, but in fact, that's what he did. So all kinds of questions about... Too bad he did it. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, of course, he didn't prove that the human mind is a machine, I'm which is what some people think. Not because of that, but that we are a computerized society, which I live with it, but it's <laughs> not necessarily the best in the best way to live in the world. <laughs> On the other hand, we wouldn't have your show if we didn't have We computers. wouldn't, but we'd be sitting around like Socrates, which I would enjoy much more, <laughs> that would, unless I were a slave or a slave. Well, I like to think we can do that, too. And, of course, in everyday life, we don't, uh, we don't think in purely deductive arguments. It's very important to isolate purely deductive arguments if you're in mathematics and you're wondering how to prove a theorem or what the axioms of a system are that are most efficient for a certain purpose. But in everyday life, we don't work with axioms. We have to work with our judgments as we find them. And we do our best to systematize them. But I think there's going to be no particular algorithm that will tell us uh, how in general to live a human life. Human life is too complex, and the world is too complex. Well, you can see the great limits to machines, no matter you know how advanced or how futuristically advanced they can they can be surmised to become. Uh, we're not even in the same unit. We're not even talking the same thing. Is is my my way of looking at it? So, so. Nevertheless, it's a remarkable thing that I will never cease to be amazed by that Frege was able to come up with uh, a formalization, a complete formalization of deductive inference. There was no reason to think at the beginning when Aristotle thought that you could develop that neat a mathematical system for catching all of those special kinds of arguments. That's a remarkable fact to me that mathematics is powerful enough to do that and that just what we learn when we learn the words all and some and none and uh, is and is not. Just what we get when we learn to use those words has that much structure to it. It's a fascinating thing. And neurophysiologists will be investigating it and are investigating it. Uh, we'll continue to do that, I think, particularly in the next century, uh, in a great deal of detail. So then we have to be very careful when we use words like all and some and everybody and nobody and mm -hmm. we have to be very careful. Yes, well, I mean, they have a certain kind of force mm -hmm. if you understand them. If you say that everyone from a certain part of town is nasty, then to hold yourself to your own language, there can't be any exceptions because all means all. And there's no further principle to give one. That's simply the way we talk. So uh, appreciation of how these words work is an enormously uh, powerful thing and enormously important thing for our ability to scrutinize one another's beliefs and understand what we're saying. Now you mentioned uh, you look at the conclusion first in order to judge how well reasoned something is. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about deductive reasoning? Deductive reasoning, purely deductive reasoning, is one form of it. But there I was speaking much more broadly about different kinds of uh, reasons that could be given to a given conclusion. My point there was just that we could have the very same conclusion argued for according to very, very different, very, very different uh, principles. For example, the death penalty. Some people who argue that the death penalty is just, argue on purely instrumental principles. Meaning? They say, well, if we put to death a certain number of criminals, then fewer criminals will appear who commit these acts in the future. It's a means-end, empirical argument. However, there could be another kind of argument, which some people also sometimes give, that an eye for an eye is the appropriate kind of justice, that if someone kills, he must in turn pay with his life. These are very, very different rationales for the same position. And philosophically and logically, we have to step back and think about what could be in the mind of someone defending such a position, 
what are these different principles, and do we think that those are good principles? How would you figure out if they're good principles? Well, in the case of the first defense of the death penalty, it's an empirical question. Is it the case that, for example, in states where the death penalty has been enforced and applied, are there fewer murders? Are there fewer crimes? I'm inclined to be very skeptical, actually, that that is, that that is so. But that would be something for sociologists and others in the legal system to investigate. But for the person who believes that an eye for an eye is the appropriate response, that murder deserves murder, that person is not interested in the empirical argument. They have a kind of moral perspective on justice, where justice has to do with, as I say, an eye for an eye. That's a very different kind of argument. And to argue against someone who holds that position, you would have to take up a complex moral view that doesn't depend on the instrumental reasoning, the empirical reasoning that I applied the, to the first case. Mm -hmm. The practical sort uh, versus the sort of uh, religious or loosely called philosophic. But you know what just went through my mind as you were saying that? Uh, let's say that murder rates did decrease because of the death penalty for the sake of, quote, mm -hmm. argument, not mm -hmm. nasty argument. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, I seem to recall something an, in logic about uh, ideas and premises and reasons being necessary and sufficient to make the case. Is that a kind of uh, logic that is both necessary and sufficient? Okay, very good, very good. Well, let's go to the person who thinks that the reason to have the death penalty enforced is the instrumental reason. And let's say they make that their... That murders will go down. That the, murder, that the rate of horrible murders will go down. And let's suppose it turns out, in a given state, that we have a correlation here. Suppose that we... Let's just we say it say, really works. Okay, suppose in that sense it really works. Well, then I think we have to step back and ask ourselves what we think of that kind of means and reasoning in a public democratic culture where policy decisions have to be made that affect large numbers of people. In other words, is every law just simply because it gets what the majority of members of the society seem to want? Is every law just that accomplishes the empirical goal that we want? Or is there something more to the concept of justice, something connected with our picture of citizens as free and equal persons, as individuals, something about respect for dignity and citizenship. These would be the kinds of philosophical questions that I think one would have to ask of the purely empirical argument from deterrence, let's say. Well, let's say you had the argument uh, of deterrence, and let's say it really worked to put people to death in reducing murders, and does it at all fit into the argument somehow if someone were to show that one or more innocent people is put to death? Does that impinge on that, or is the logic of people just saying, hey, we need to reduce crime, this reduces it, that's all we need to know? Or is there a place within that argument for a premise or assumption or fact that one or more innocent people will, will get put to death. These are connected, although I would say somewhat separate, somewhat separate issues. Um, you used the phrase necessary and sufficient before. Certainly it's a necessary condition of this instrumentalist's argument that the empirical facts cohere. But that's not to say that the argument is sufficient in itself for us to say that the death penalty is just more would have to be said. And How do it you is know? How do you know it's not sufficient? How do you know more would have to be said? More would have to be said because it's part of the way we justify particular laws, particularly laws that are controversial, like the death penalty. In our public culture, it's not enough to just say it works. People want more of an answer than that to the question. Those on the other side who feel that there's something inherently 
questionable about the state taking the life of one of its citizens. And so it won't be enough for the other side to answer the criticisms simply to say it works. Of course, if you're a critic of the death penalty, you have to face it if, in fact, that is the case, that empirically it does deter criminals. But there are other grounds that you can give. So the argumentative structure has a necessity to it, but it's not sufficient to argue that the death penalty is just. In other words, part of our conception of justice, a just society, has to do with viewing members of society as free and equal beings, whether they're prisoners or not prisoners. And therefore, this kind of worry, which I think is a real worry about enforcing the death penalty, that there will be cases where innocent people are actually killed by the state, this kind of example is something on people's minds because we like to think of our society, if it is, to the extent that it is a just society, as a cooperative enterprise between free and equal human beings. We don't like to think that we just sacrifice a few innocent victims for the sake of the happiness of a larger number of people. Well, I do hear that kind of uh, rhetoric on, on radio somewhat. Yes. Especially now yes. going to Iraq, for example. Ha! Collateral. Yes. The word collateral is used like um, sandwich or, or McDonald's. It, collateral, you know, they, 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 it's thrown under the rug. Of course some people will die, but, and that's always said really fast, and then on to, on to the so-called reasoning. Mm -hmm. But, of course, um, in the public culture, I think it's the duty of all of us in the United States to have a more well-reasoned public debate about this. I'm disappointed that it isn't happening more now. Um, I think there are a lot of complex motives and reasons behind all of this. But, um, but yes, it's, it's part of hoping for a better state of the world that we would like citizens to demand of leadership better arguments and um, at least to have the price of certain policy decisions made explicit in a public forum. I think that this is a very important thing. It's part, as I say, of the whole ideal of a democratic society as a cooperative enterprise among individuals, each one of whom has a certain freedom and sense of dignity and respect. That's part of the core notion, I think. And to the extent that that is not respected in public discourse, it's a very bad thing. Right. And some people point out we're not a democracy, we're a republic. This has been pointed out a lot. And that everybody does not have an equal voice. This is a common kind of point made on, on radio and television these days. Well, of course, the impact of special interest money, the impact of lack of education, the impact of the difficulty some voters have in getting to the bowls. These are real obstacles. But here I'm speaking in a way from the point of view of a more idealized, logical conception, um, realizing fully well that the situation is not ideal. Nevertheless, the way we reason in a democracy, the ideals that we hold our public figures accountable to are, I think, of really Im big importance. They do actually affect, in the long run, the way the institutions work, even if all of us are sophisticated enough to see how special interest groups and money actually affect things. We have a prejudice against politics as a nasty business. I think we're unfortunately not aware how fundamental politics are to how much we enjoy a sandwich, for that matter. Much more fundamental, hardly an isolated, specific and separate kind of human activity or human concern. Yes, I think there's a great deal of false cynicism and false sophistication now, where it's easy to dismiss 
the demand for public accountability and uh, public justification of policy decisions. I think that if Americans on the whole cannot continue to press forward and demand arguments from people, though, that then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, there will not be anything like uh, a forum in which public reason can make itself felt. And here I use a term coined by uh, the great American political philosopher John Rawls, who died this past fall, a very great figure, because he really showed how in political philosophy we could try to get clearer at a very abstract level about the most fundamental principles that ought to shape our way of thinking about justice. Uh, you know, uh, to be cynical myself, I might throw at us that uh, perhaps our brains are, are dancing to the algorithms of the computer. So mm -hmm. that, and it's true, mm -hmm. to a degree, our brains are being conditioned by the algorithms of the computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are not exercising mm -hmm. the, the rhetorical and logical muscle arduously, even by the fact of being at the computer for so many hours, usurping time that we would be juxtaposed and relating and thrashing things out with each other. And when you say, f you use the word forum, it, it, it harkens back to Greece, where mm -hmm. what they did was in a forum mm -hmm. when they did all their discussing. Mm -hmm. And then one thinks, of course, that the unexamined life is not worth living. But as mm -hmm. we started out saying that even if we're not examining, we are virtually examining. I mean, even mm -hmm. if we're denying we're examining, mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're faced with death of anyone, even people we, we are examining, mm -hmm. even if we have to close, our, close ourselves mm -hmm. to it which takes a toll on, on us in some other way. Okay. Do you think over time, given some of the ideas you, you've thrown out that uh, ways that we could be in reasons, again, reasons, 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 that's what's so important here, reasons of why we do things and how we get to those reasons and conclusions. Do you think that over time we've become philosophically more mature on the whole, broadly speaking? Well, I think if we look at science and mathematics, and broadly speaking science here, I mean branches of inquiry into the nature of society as well as, as the world as a whole, there is no doubt that we know much, much more now than we did 10 years ago, much less than 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Um, it's incredible how successful science and technology have been. Uh, there, I think, we can expect a growth. In a way, the paradox now is that there's too much that's known. And it's very, very difficult for a philosopher now, impossible, in fact, for a philosopher, to know as much as you would need to know all the science of your day. So I think there, there's a great deal to be hopeful about. I think if we look at moral and political philosophy, um, there I wobble back and forth about how optimistic I really am about the future of democratic society on the planet. I think that the United States represents one effort, one experiment, to use the phrase of uh, It is an framers. experiment. It's a technological experiment. It's both a technological experiment, but it's also a philosophical experiment in whether certain ideals of democracy can actually be realized, however partially, in human life and sustained over time. And it's very important to realize that before the end of the 18th century, this really was viewed as an experiment likely to fail. That is to say, other forms of human government, uh, the divine right of kings, um, feudal tradition, other forms of organizing human society seemed like they would be the necessary ones. So I wobble back and forth. I certainly hope that uh, around the world, democratic industrial life has a chance of succeeding. I think that if it doesn't,
it's a terrible thing. Um, the, the great thing, I think, about the work of Rawls is that Rawls was perfectly aware, as aware as anyone I ever knew or spoke with, about all the reasons why <laughs> one could be pessimistic about political culture in the United States. Nevertheless, he devoted his life to trying to come up with a set of principles that would orient our thinking on the assumption that it was at least a coherent ideal to try to strive for, despite special interest groups, despite all the barriers to equality of opportunity, despite the rise of religion around the world. All of that, Rawls thought, was uh, to be grappled with. And he really worked hard to try to make democracy a coherent ideal. And I think that's a very tough job, actually, in our day and age, where so many of us hold such radically different perspectives on what's morally right and wrong, what the right form of life is for a human being. I think it's a very important point. How can you even make it a coherent ideal that human beings who differ on fundamental points of value can nevertheless reason together in a public forum and live with each other as a positive good? Well, we can definitely reason together, and we're coming down to the end here, so I can't get into that, but we can definitely reason together. You've, uh, in a tiny way, awakened in me a sense of what I was living for to begin with, something I've had to squash and quash as, as I've become more automatonic and computerized to march in step with the culture. That's how I feel about it. It may not be. But I, when I said philosophically more mature, I was referring to everybody. In other words, when there's a, quote, lynching, God forbid, do, do, when, when we see you know, maybe fictional movies of everybody coming out to the square and yelling and, and going home and even enjoying it to like the great division amongst people or, or any subject you want, you want to take, you know, less barbarism, even though there is so much barbarism, has, has, have the seeds of discontent and examination, you know, spread a little bit further over time ever so slowly. I think if we talk about the experiment in the United States, the answer must be yes. That is, terrible things happen, but there are no longer public lynchings um, which people are not ashamed of. Within the public discourse, no matter, no matter that there are, of course, racist politicians who we know are uh, are unjust, okay. they're not allowed to speak in ways that they used to be able to speak. And in that sense, we reason better. Okay, we are going to wrap it here. I'll give you one final quick or as we wrap. Here you are, levitating and abstract. How do you go about your daily life of just being concrete and driving a car and stopping at a red light? <laughs> well, I have a wonderful daughter and a wonderful father of my daughter. She's 16 months old. Her name is Margot Sachi. And uh, she brings me down to earth. She's often asking why and just bringing her into the human form of life that's language is a very great joy to me and teaches me a lot. She never lets me get too abstract. This concludes our show on philosophy and logic. Thank you for listening. Best of reasoning skills to you.